afternoon and welcome to Tales from the Sale. This is our second episode and therefore a new and improved episode. Today I'm interviewing the amazing, the tall, the gorgeous, the brilliant Teresa Huggins, mother of three, real estate warrior, an agent in the trenches for over 25 years, a multi-time winner of both unit and production in her Colwell Banker office. Teresa, I'm so glad you came to see me today. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Brian. Um... Was real estate your first job? No, 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 no. Okay. No one. It's never anybody's first job. What did you do first? I was in sales for fresh, uh, fresh produce. Import, export sales in New York. Very different. How did you end up down here? I was here on a business trip, and I went to a bar. Well, I like to refer to it as a restaurant. Sounds better. Yesterday's. Uh, called McGuffey's. McGuffey's. On 321. On 321. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's one of those in Morganton. Yeah. There's a whole chain. There was. And they kind of trimmed just, down a little bit on their inventory. But I was there on business with a friend. And I was coming from New Jersey. There were no pictures on our license. So when they asked, when I asked for a drink, they wouldn't serve me. Because my photo wasn't on the ID, so I can't even blame it on the You're alcohol. Kidding me. No. How old were you? Nineteen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit older. A little bit older. So you you met somebody then? I met my husband. Was he working at McGuffey's? No, he was uh, there with some friends. They had just come off the golf course, and he was there having a drink with some friends. And there you go. What yeah, year was that? Yeah, there you go. Nineteen ninety-two. Okay. So you fell in love, moved to Hickory, mm-hmm. ditched the produce. Yeah. Get married, date, what, what happened? Well, you know, we, we dated long distance for two years, and then I moved down here when we got married. And I loved the work I was doing. I even uh, had an opportunity to continue it from home down here. That was before remote was popular. That was like, you know, that was a big deal. Wow. But my father, even though he was in banking by profession, he was involved in housing developments on the side. And so he always liked it. And he had my mother get her license and she did not care for it. So I did all her legwork and I loved it. So So you were pulling two jobs already at once with one foot in the real estate world. I just, yeah, I just liked it. It's like a well-paid hobby. So you moved down here what year? 94. Got married. Got married, moved here right afterwards, started a family. I I got into real estate as soon as I moved here because I didn't know what I would do with my time. Like I I couldn't be a non-working wife. Had to be active. Mm -hmm. So you got the real estate school. Who did you do real estate school with? I did a semester class at CVCC. And then I guess I just sat for the state exam. Did you pass it on the first time? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's always a nerve. I was lucky. Experience. It's not. It's you know. Some there's a lot of smart people that are, that are not good test takers. I was fortunate. Uh, did your dad follow you down here to do any development or no? He would have liked to. Unfortunately, he passed right after I moved. Oh, sorry about that. That's uh, glad to see you're carrying on the legacy and honoring him with that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, he'd love it. Was he your mentor? He was a great example and mentor for all things, but I didn't really have a mentor in real estate. It was a, you know, thrown into it, learn as you go. You get your license, where do you go? I, hmm. so interestingly enough, I'm with Caldwell Banker. Yes. Love the company. Wanted to go there originally, but spoke to another individual who wanted me to go into partnership with him. Y'all started a firm together, I believe. We did. Yep. And um, I did that for a number of years. And then when we dissolved that company, I went to Caldwell Banker, which is where I needed to be. Under I was destined great, to be. Under great leadership. No kidding. <laughs> God, it's the best. They, oh, we, they we are the all, best. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck there yeah, forever. I, I've tried to break in there many times. <laughs> and, uh, one day. One day. <laughs> um, how long did you run your own program? with or partner with it was probably hmm, probably about 12 years i'd say so it's kind of interesting i have a great respect for people that run their own business because 
until you do, it's hard to appreciate all of the time and work and money that goes into it. What was the biggest surprise that you found doing running your own business? Um, the, the most surprising from a, wow, I didn't take that into consideration. Was it people management? I think was it the, money, time? I think to an extent it was the realization that not everybody shares your same work ethic. And that's kind of tough because you expect everyone to do things the way you do it, and it's disappointing when they don't. Yeah, yeah. It, clearly. You get your license. How long till you partnered to do this probably, immediately? Like, yeah, immediately. probably within months. What was your first sale? Oh, it was this cute house in Mountain View. It, uh, it was to a widowed woman who... I thought was older at the time, but as time goes by, I'm thinking she was quite young. <laughs> anyway, it was the first house I showed her, really? and she wanted it. And I thought, well, I can't just sell her the first house she sees. So I insisted that we look at others. And we went back to that house. That's oh. what she bought. But I felt like I needed to make sure she was aware of her choices. It, it, brilliant step in the right mm. direction on how to do our job. Like, hey... Let's make sure you know what your other options are. Nothing's worse than somebody saying, well, you didn't show me this or that. And that's awesome. Well, so, we'll see. So, <laughs> so she bought it. Out. Did she you know it. her beforehand? No. It was a cold call, and she was a really sweet lady. It was a good first experience. Did you? Were you selling on your own? Were you selling as a team? You said you I've had a always, I've always been on my own always selling. Always on your own. Mm-hmm. How do you run your program now? Do you have anybody <laughs> underneath you? No. No. You're totally. <laughs> do you have anybody who does listing input? Well, at Caldwell Banker, we have a great administrative team. So they do a lot of that administrative type of work for you. But as far as like working with a team or, or an assistant, I w- if I'm booked already, I'll have somebody help me out. If I'm on vacation, I'll have somebody help me out. But for all intents yeah. and purposes, it's me. Do you work more with buyers or sellers? Probably equally. Equally? I would think. Think there's some big changes coming? There's always changes coming. Know, there's some interesting changes Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that all falls into place. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so you, you run your own firm with somebody... When did when did you all change over? Was this a crash of 08, 09? Yeah, there was just, we were going, the, the partner and I were going into different directions. We had different ideas of what should be prioritized. So it just worked out that we dissolved. Yeah. And that, you moved to Coal Banker 08, 09? 09, 10, 09, March 09. of 09. That was the heart of it. It was the heart of it. <laughs> that was the craziest part. Um. Let's let's talk more specifics. So, craziest thing you think a showing houses? You've shown a lot of houses. Tell me some stuff you come across. Oh my gosh, I've had lots of interesting experiences. So, when you're going to look at a house, you set up an appointment. The seller approves it. They're aware that you're coming. So in one instance, I had this very nice couple, and I always ring the doorbell before I open it with a key just to make sure there's no surprises. And so I open the the door, and as soon as you open the front door, there is a staircase to the second story. At At the top of that staircase is a bathroom. The door is open. There is somebody using the bathroom. So I... Got a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit surprised there. And I shut the door. A little flustered. But yeah, I know a little you flustered recovered. for sure. Yep. And then I like I left it open a crack and I yelled up there. I said, I am so sorry, sir. Did your agent not tell you we were coming? So this wasn't your listing? No. Oh. And he said, yeah, I, I knew you were coming. Oh. Like, how do you answer that? So I said, you know, we're going to just walk around the outside and we'll be back shortly. I mean, what do you do? Was he an owner or renter? He was the owner. <laughs> I mean, 
So how long did you pause before you went back in there? Was he clothed? He, uh, when we went back in, I, I again rang the doorbell. This time I just cracked the door open and I yelled for him and he came to the door dressed. So, you know, that's an improvement. I didn't shake his hand. (laughs) That was before masks and antibacterials and all. Did they buy the house? No, they were they were a little bit. Uh, I guess they maybe had already made a determination that this would not be their house. That brings us to an interesting question: what What have you seen people decide unusual things? You've seen people decide not to purchase a property because of. Like Northwest here we got, Hickory. Oh, yeah. Here we got a dude sitting on a john and yeah, that, that was, uh, just puts an image in people's hat and now exactly, I can't buy that house. Exactly. What are some other, like? Had a, had a home couple was looking at this home. We, were, we had a whole string of homes to look at that day. We walked in the house. I don't think the wife was five feet into the house. She started shaking, started crying. And ran out of the house and said there was a presence in the house and that she could not be in there. And somebody certainly died. Um, and she wanted me to look into it because she just couldn't believe I would take her to a house that was uh, spirited. Wow. Mm-hmm. Did you look into it? I did. I asked some uh, of the previous owners. Nobody knew of anything. Nothing. I don't honestly recall what this couple ended up buying. I know I worked with them still, but I don't recall what they ended up buying. I don't think it was, you know, haunted. It'd be my guess. Would be be your guess. Mm-hmm. Have you ever shown a house where you felt like mm, there's a questionable history behind it? Not a... Like so, to a point where you're like, I wouldn't live in this not house. Not so much a question. I've never had that where, where it was like a weird, uncomfortable yeah. feeling. But I did have a house one time I was showing and it was... Um, it must have been like winter time because it was fairly early, but it was dark and it was raining and it was just a, not a pleasant night to be out. And I was meeting a couple there and it was kind of isolated, this home. And I had gone into the house, got there earlier so I can turn lights on and whatnot. And I heard coughing, like somebody coughing in the basement. And the owner, it was a vacant home. So I did not, um, I quickly turned the lights off, locked the door. Um, I called the agent that had it listed. I called my clients and told them not to come. I don't know whatever happened, but I, I got out of there. Wow. That, that creepy. I mean, it was creepy. Like I, I did not feel comfortable and I, I don't get like that typically. I've been in a few basements of homes that were pre-Civil War over in Morganton hmm. that you're down there and you're like, yeah, this is just a little weird. Um, but I've never had that. I've never heard the cough or... Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, fu- I'm funny with basements unless it's people that I know. Like, I, I'm very fortunate. I've been very lucky where I work with people that I know, a lot of repeat business or referrals from a, f- a friend or you know, previous client. Yeah. But every once in a while, I'll have somebody want to meet me at a house and I don't know them. Mm-hmm. So I don't, you know, I'm not yeah. really sure how to read them yet. But if there is, um, there is a gentleman one time, it was kind of odd because he, he said he knew me, told me where he knew me from, which was not accurate, gave me a different name than what he, who he said he was when I met him at the house. Red flag, And this red house flag. was vacant, and it had a basement. And I thought, oh, gosh, this is not going to end well. I'm going to be mm-hmm. a statistic. So I, I told him, you know, hold on a minute. I've got the file in my car. So I called, you know, my office, and I said, call me every five minutes. Make sure I'm okay. This is where I'm at. Yeah. So we went in the house and he's like, oh, let's go check out the basement. And I said, well, you can, you know, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll be up here because I thought, oh, this is, this is crazy. So I, I mean, the whole time and we went through that house, it was the only house he wanted to see. I never heard from him again. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and then the person who was supposed to be calling me forgot to call me. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Hank. <laughs> I called the person. I called the person that just want to let you know I'm dead. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I know. appreciate it. Appreciate the What backup. are you going to do? Oh, that's crazy. What else have you seen people walk away from a house for? Have just petty things do. How do you feel about furniture, painting, clutter? Do you ever see people turn away from a house because of those things? Yes. A lot of people fail to appreciate the importance of a good first impression. And not every seller is in a position to have their house ready. Maybe they're older, uh, have health issues, you know, things happen. And so you have to understand all that. Um, But I I showed a house one time, the um, obviously the people knew we were coming because they got their bedrooms ready. They must have picked up everything that was on the floor, piled it on top of their bed and then pulled the covers over it. So every bed had this huge hump like it was a trash dump, but like covered, you know? It, it, was, it was so interesting. But things like that are, are a turn off. A little bit of effort goes a long way. It is. Um, buyers that could use, that can look past things are, are special uh, too. Yes. They, a lot of people think they can look past it. They can't. They really think they can. They truly believe it, but they can't. Houses I found clients will describe as, oh, the ugly curtain house or the filthy rug house or, and that's how they've, you can hear them talking about it in their head. I mean, they're talking about it to me and therefore in their head, they've they've already crossed X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z off because of these things. Right. That's and that's amazing. like when a seller's ready to get on the market and they're not quite ready in your opinion. Maybe the yard needs to be cleaned up. Maybe the carpets need to be cleaned, what what have you. To say, but I, I need to get it on the market this weekend. You try to tell them, you know, if they'll just wait another week and get these things done, mm-hmm. it would be to their benefit. And I, I understand the urgency. People get very anxious about it. They're ready to go. But it does pay off. It it really should be right. Definitely. Um <laughs> That led me to a question I just forgot. Um, the when t- when taking someone to a house and they see these things, do you prefer a house that is empty, partially staged, or totally lived in? Do you have a preference? I mean, obviously, it, it, it really it, depends on the property. You have somebody that needs that looks like they're on hoarders. That's different, but. It's, you know, we all think we have good taste. Clearly people well, don't. and you know. But everybody's taste is different because if we all had the same taste, it'd be a very boring Correct. world. We'd all want the same thing. That's exactly So right. that wouldn't work. No. But for the most part, if the house is going to be empty, it should be fully empty. If you have like a chair and a table and a lamp in one room and then, you know, stuff couple bar stools with no bar like in another room it's better off it's just completely empty put it in the garage or what have you but um if it's night i mean if if a house is staged nicely or nicely decorated i mean that's what stagers do right that's people watch hgtv for that reason because it looks so nice everybody wants it everybody wants it have you ever had a seller that was totally excited about what they've done oh gosh yes and that you just do you remember sponge painting oh yes the walls that were yes i have have two girls yeah yeah. they're 21 yeah they're age 20 years ago our there's a lot of things that were sponge painted all over 20 years ago is the key right It, it wasn't very popular then and i don't and that might have that might have been even riding on the edge oh yeah so about maybe 14 years ago, I had a seller, and she had lots of different colors on her walls, and I told her it would be very helpful if she would do a fresh paint, maybe neutralize it just to appeal to different people. And so she called me a week later and said, I've just painted everything. Come look. She sponged every wall. One room was like a 
I always call it gumball green. You know that green in a gumball? Oh, yeah. I don't know what the proper name is. Mr. Or, Ick or green. Or bright blue yeah. or a bright red. Each room was sponged a different color. And I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. How did it work out? Did you sell the house? Yeah, sold the house. But, you know, it's like, and and what do you say? She, you know, there, she was so proud of her work. And I said, you know, mm. gosh, you, you've spent a lot of time on this. You put a whole lot of good time effort. in this yes appreciate your good effort that's exactly right um have you ever fired a client oh yes buyer seller it was a seller what happened um i think that this person probably had some diminished capacity mm -hmm. that nobody was aware of yet <sighs> That's tough. And in the conversation, I would be getting random calls, and it was very unpleasant. And you're and like, I, I no, nah, I just I don't need this. Finally, told her that I think she would be better suited with another agent. Did she ever end up selling her house? Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and well, actually, it was her her children that sold it. She ended up being moved. They, so you called it. She had yeah, that was something perfect. going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was, that's tough. It is tough. Yeah, is, really um, sweet, sweet person. Um, tools of the trade you carry in your trunk. <laughs> besides, uh, besides to call your besides office. Besides my and, double bubble bubble gum. <laughs> um, I keep a rubber mallet, some zip ties, um, duct tape, glove. No, I don't have a duct tape. <laughs> A knife, with no. a pistol. <laughs> Actually, I keep a, um, I do keep like a pocket knife, yeah. and I keep zip ties and, um, and water, a blanket, and um, my oh gosh, my measuring tape. Have to have that. A couple, a spare two lock box. Spare two lock box. Uh, do you use uh, combination or century lock? I use the combo lock, which is just really funny that uh, a lot of agents, either really young agents or agents from outside this market, don't know how, even even when you explain how to use it, they don't know how to use it. Are you using the locker room locker? The, the twist locker room, room oh. locker. Yeah. I won't go into my feelings on that one. I did and have I, a client. I'm not superior at that. Are you... Uh, I had a, a client that I was showing a house to, and I couldn't get the lockbox up. And he was like, oh, I so used to. You're one of, you're and, one and of those. And then he went around, he just like tweak, tweak, tweak. Yeah, you're one of those that I, I talk am. about. Yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> no. one of those no, that I'm like, have, oh, like, welcome the to technology. And, then, like, and I do have Supra boxes too. So you do use Supra. Which is, well, I have in the past, like depending the on the Supra. market. I said Century, I meant the, Supra. Yeah, the Supra. Yeah. The, it's really not great, though, when your uh, internet's down. That's a problem. The internet's never been down. Yeah, well, my mistake. <laughs> Ever. Uh, but it does let you know who goes in, when it goes out. I do like the logging of it for secure, you know, security purposes. fantastic. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty solid. Um, what's the most unusual item you've seen clients fight ever? Were you representing the seller? I, let, let, me, let me back up real quick. How often are you... A, you, you said you work evenly. How often are you a dual agent? Is that commonplace um, for you? I'd say maybe, I'd say at least 25% of the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And knock I think on we're going to be dual agents issue. a lot more going forward. And I, that's, I know some people get uh, apprehensive about it, but typically a buyer wants a buy or seller wants a sell. You just yeah. have to come up with the terms that work for everybody. But I did have a seller. I didn't have the buyer on this one, but I had a seller who had a chandelier that was given to her. You know them. That was given to her from chandelier. her husband. And we stipulated that the chandelier would be switched out prior to closing. And they, if they'd like, they could provide their own and we would switch it for them. Great. Yes. What happened? Well, the buyer had to have the chandelier. Had to have it. Had to have it. It's like because it was taboo. Because you couldn't have it, they had to have it. Had to have it. Had to have it. They were probably from up north. Who who ended up getting the chandelier? The seller kept it. Seller kept it? Mm-hmm. How did it resolve yourself? And we... I f was able to find them a source where they could get 
So you had to go chandelier shopping, basically. Basically. Mm -hmm. Mm. Isn't it amazing? All the things we do. Mm -hmm. It's 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 awesome. Um, Oh, that's awesome. Um, Let's see. That's Hank question from my last notes. There's Mm -hmm. something there. I need to change that up. Um, Let's see. Have you ever considered doing a team? It it would probably be smart to do that. It would make my life easier. However, I mean, as far as time management, maybe because I don't have a life. I don't go anywhere. I don't do anything because I'm working all the time. But you play some tennis. Not that. Not enough. Kevin said she hadn't seen you out there in a while. Because but I've you been, do. You did play the tennis. I did for a while there. Mm-hmm. Um, need to get back to that, but. Um, my issue with the team kind of goes back to the, one of the first questions you asked about when I was involved in running a business. It's really hard. I, it's really hard when you have high expectations, you want everybody to have those same high expectations. And there are other agents, plenty that are excellent that would, that have a similar work ethic and style as I do that, you know, somebody like that to partner with would be great. But for the most part, any time you get into a team situation, I've seen a lot of uh, situations unfold where it becomes a a problem. It works great for some. Yeah. So I, I just, I don't see that happening. What's your least favorite form? The mineral oil gas rights form is ridiculous. But it's one page. Right. That you have to put a lot of little initials on because somebody, you, you know the reason behind that form. Yeah, from was the that, fracking. Yeah, yeah, fracking in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, it's just, to me, it's just silly. It's childish. Mm-hmm. The Where do you stand? Hank and I got into it on our last episode. Um, res, I mean, the... Uh, provision where where we do all the check boxes of residential all the property, the property disclosure, disclosure or the professional the, um, professional services, professional services. i kind of like it gosh you don't like it can't stand it why oftentimes i'm filling it out for a seller mm-hmm. and it is the only thing on there from a seller's perspective oh, is, is the attorney, the attorney. Mm-hmm. so i've got to put 13 initials times two okay. and and then when there's multiple owners on that, I deal with a vacation property where there might be six people. I've got to put six, and it just, I, I, I hate it. I agree, and I understand, and I had tennis elbow for quite a while, and all those little initial boxes, that's a little bit uh, much. They should have it separate. They should have it just for the buyer, because it is a good checklist really for you to make sure nothing's slipping through the cracks and to make sure you've explained the different inspections etc that somebody might want to have done but like you said for the seller it's just the attorney it shouldn't it shouldn't be that form yeah the seller it should i agree should just be i think that's my biggest problem not necessarily i think for the you buyer. should like here's i a bunch think of you should change it you might need. yeah i think there You're should be powerful. a buyer form and a seller form agree yeah. take well, care of it we solve the real estate problems of the world um <laughs> Hank, when I was talking to Hank today, just getting some background on you, he put you on a pedestal. He's like, oh, Teresa's, she's who everybody wants to be. Oh, I have him fooled. <laughs> Shh. Shh um, don't tell anybody. You, you've, you've gotten to a point in your career. Are you growing, maintaining, stepping back? Where are you? Definitely not stepping back. Um, you know, I think you're, Oh, you're either moving forward or you're, it's very hard to be just status quo maintenance, right? So you're either moving forward or you're going back. So I'd have to say I'm going forward in this current market with very low inventory and then some higher interest rates that we've seen of late. It's been more of a maintenance, which is absolutely fine. I have done this long enough where I appreciate a little bit of a slower time because I know it's short lived. What's your most expensive sale? Buyer side, seller side. Um, Tell me about it. Well, I've got like a 
nice one coming up if it closes, so I can't say so it because it would jinx that. it now. Yeah, so no, that would be even, by that'll be by far. That. Yeah, that'll yeah. be that'll be my yeah. largest. That'll be your largest. Yeah. So if I don't count that, I would say probably like a one point seven five. Home. In in town, Lake Hickory, where um, I've done some commercial. Lake Norman, and then um, and then in Hickory, and the one that I'm working on right now is commercial, well, land. Okay, that's that's going to be a big closing. Um, what do you find? What was your most satisfying satisfying close that you've ever had? I'm f- honestly fortunate. Of- fortunate enough to say that I really like my clients and I've had really good experiences. Um, probably I I had a young couple. They were very, very limited to what they could buy. And I probably worked more hours with them than almost anybody. What'd you learn? Was it like a VA loan or it f- wasn't uh, even that they FHA had a hard time? Or? It was oh, I think it was was FHA, but we couldn't. This was two years ago or a year and a half when the market was already on fire, and so we were getting beat out on every offer, and so they could only look on weekends. So I worked with them. I couldn't tell you how many weekends, but what I learned, well, what I always believed is that every sale is just as important regardless of their price point, their situation, whatnot. But somebody has to help them. Yeah. Somebody has to do it. What was the price home? 130. And you busted your tail for that, oh, didn't you? Oh my goodness. Yeah, not even on the radar of the 28 years you've been doing it and and that yeah, that's what pops in your head. That's pretty that's cool. That's what I That's really spe- that speaks volumes mm-hmm. of we're not in it for this. We're obviously in it to make a living, but we're not in it for the specific sale. You exemplified that, putting the effort right there. I mean, well, I mean, you, you have to if you're doing the right job. Although a lot of people do think you're in it just for the fun and not for the money because the things that sellers and buyers ask you to pay for. It's amazing. It, it is. What, what? Tell me something you've been asked to pay for. Oh, my gosh. A tractor, an <laughs> oriental rug. Um, somebody's air conditioning unit. And I remember just finally saying, to, I usually just, you know, explain, you know, maybe some of our options. I don't buy them a new air conditioning unit. But one day it was an agent. It was the listing agent. There was an issue. My buyers had their home inspection. The HVAC was not working on one of the floors. And she said, well, it was working just fine maybe you should buy them. This was the agent asking me. This is not the buyer or the seller. And I said, nobody buys my new system in my house when it goes out. Why? Like, I don't understand where this is coming from. So, you know, there's lots of interesting people in this field. Is that agent still in business? I don't know. No, that's probably a good question. Probably not. Yeah. Um, you would think I'd remember the name, but I don't. Well, we tend to forget those. Mm. Move on. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's awesome. Where? What's the farthest place you've ever sold? How far away have you traveled? Um, and why was it for? It was it a great client? Was it a friend? Well, I had one client wanting to sell their home in Italy, and I offered to help them, but it didn't. It didn't come didn't to happen. fruition, unfortunately. Like that would be you would have had to go over there and take I know, pictures. Because, it would have been awful. You know, at Coldwell Banker, we're full service and we're international, so and we you go need everywhere. a month to immerse yourself in the well, property. Yeah, because you don't want yeah, to you don't want to make a, any kind of a rash opinion. You need to do your due diligence, of course. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. So, okay. um, I've I've done some in, a lot in not a lot, but a few like in Charlotte, Belmont, Lake Norman for past clients. Yeah. that want me to help them with it and and if i feel honestly if i feel like i'm not going to do them a justice then i'll refer it to somebody who knows the market yeah that, I'm, that's obviously the best way to go go about stuff and that's awesome um from a 
you said you'd fired a seller. Buyers, have you ever gotten to the point of working with somebody and been like, this just isn't, what you want is unrealistic or I can't help you or we're not clicking. You've worked with enough buyers out there. What point do you just pull the parachute and bail out and move on? Never have. Never have. Mm -mm. That's pretty impressive. Not really. It's stupid. (laughs) Hey, you're sitting across the table from me getting interviewed. That says you're, I mean, you know what you're doing. No, it's just, um, you know, at some point, and, and I'll get like, there's some really, uh, really nice, capable, newer agents. And I was talking with one of them and he was telling me, he was trying to get a house that I had listed and just like, I've got to get him a house. You have no idea. He said, and my wife keeps telling me to just cut loose, you know, and he goes, but I've already worked with them for so long. I've shown them 40 houses, you know, I, and I said, I, I understand it. It's like, you're, I'm going to take this to the finish line. Yeah. Yeah. The drive. Exactly. You got to do it. Yeah. I, don't, I think that's indicative of a lot of agents who have been in it a long time. Like, fine, we've got to find these people a house. Even though at this point, after driving around and hauling and hoping, as Bill Gallagher would say. Bill Gallagher. Um, we've, we're going to get there. We're going to get to the to the end, and, and we're going to make it happen. Because we know they're going to come back. Seven years later, whatever the average number is, they hold that house, and we're going to do some more business down the road, and it's probably not going to be as crazy. Well, and the thing is, sometimes, for whatever reason, the house, you just can't find the right house. And that doesn't diminish your relationship with the client. And I mean, I've been so fortunate. My clients are great. I, they, so many of them are friends now. I mean, I, I wish I had time to spend with all of the people I would like to spend time with because they're, I've had so many great people. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we meet some of the best people in the world. We just, you don't get to spend all the time in the world with them. We got to mm-hmm. make our choices and go on. Um, what do you do when you go on vacation since you're not part of a team? I know you never take vacation. I don't, but when very, you, I honestly, my husband and I are taking a trip next month. It will be our, first trip since our honeymoon except for beach vacations with the kids to which i had my phone and computer that's oh sad. yeah that's that standard is, yeah it's sad so um, what percent how many times do you go on vacation and a deal happens oh it's in fact 90%. if you have a house that just won't sell for whatever reason go on vacation and, and then what everyone happens? will phone need call you absolutely immediately yeah so that's what you do sometimes yeah. i go to the beach just to sell a home Yep. It's 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 uncanny how that happens. <laughs> and the week of Christmas. Every year the week of Christmas. I'm always busy, always selling something. You leave and a client you haven't heard from in two and a half years calls and another client you haven't heard from in three years calls and it's yeah, that's mm-hmm. how it happens. That's yep, it's like a feast and feast or feast famine. Feast or famine. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's awesome. So where are you going with your husband where's your trip we are cruising through england scotland and iceland satellite deals i i'm making up for all those (laughs) how long are you leaving for probably gone for i think it's 10 days maybe so you can look at real estate over there um you know what i'll tell you something so funny I, i hope not but i'm sure when you are somewhere regardless of whether it's you know, visiting another town or somewhere for a wedding or anywhere you're saying you check out the real estate. Do you not? Always. Right. So that's just what we do. So the only time I didn't check out real estate was several years back when I was helping to chaperone my daughter's senior week. Okay. And I should have. Cause, Why is that? Well, because we ended up buying a vacation home several years later. The market had already changed. And it had blown up. Oh, my gosh. But the house that they had stayed in, that I had chaperoned in, was a much larger, grander, I mean, bells and whistle house that would have been less than the house that we bought if I would have just looked at the real estate. But I was exhausted. How do you, in, in my world, I hear 
what I sell is vacation homes and stuff that people don't need. Right. You sell stuff that people need and vacation homes. You're jack of all trade. I, I'm more in unnecessary items. We get the people from North Carolina who have always looked at homes on Lake James, Lake Hickory, even ta- homes in Hickory. Mm-hmm. And our version of we've watched pricing progress at a certain rate and come down at a certain rate. When 09 happened and then it continued on, how much, how many, what percent of your clients are coming in from out of state that are disrupting what we perceive as normal? And it, oh. it kind of crushes our... It hurts your local people. Our, our local people have this belief in their head. And it's, it's, it's not that it's right or wrong, but they're like, that house will never sell for this price. And I'm like, well, uh, Joe Byer from California has just sold his 1,800-square-foot ranch in Silicon Valley for $9 million. He's looking at your 4,000-square-foot home that he can buy for... 800,000 and he thinks that's the best deal in the world. How are you dealing with that? Because I find it fascinating. It's I'm watching buyers lose out because their inability. That's the hardest part is that especially like your first time home buyers. I feel so bad for them or just your local people that can't compete. And not only are folks from outside our market coming in and, buying these houses at prices over list price, but they're offering cash. So how do you compete with that? Can't. Yeah. I I, I don't know. It's, I think it's a confidence level that we, we're behind the curve on. And I say we, the owners in our area, owners in North Carolina who have not seen what's gone on in California, Texas, Florida, other right. states, the states that people are leaving and coming mm-hmm. here who see us as a great value, they're getting killed. Absolutely. And they, the believe, where does you, where do you stand on? Is the market inflated? Is the market? I don't think it's below? inflated. I think it's our new normal. I don't, I, nor everyone wants to be in North Carolina in addition to maybe, you know, South Carolina, Tennessee or other states, but North Carolina is a very desirable state. And it's always interesting when people come in from out of the area and they're not here for a job. They just decided to look in the area and I ask them why. And they, oh, I love North Carolina, like the weather, all this other stuff. And I'm like, but why our area specifically? And those articles have been very effective that have been published in U.S. News and some of these other outlets that keep talking about how wonderful we are. But it's... um. I, it's our. I don't see anything changing. I really don't. I think that we're going to continue to see slow, steady for a number of years. Where do you sit when you have a client that says we're we're in a bubble? Obviously, obviously we're in a bubble. How do you respond to that? Because I, I get that all the time, and I, I want to hear your response. I tell them that um, I don't have a crystal ball but that I don't believe that's the case. And I explain to them why, as far as, you know, the amount of people coming in, why they're coming in, the differential between what they're selling in California or New York or where, wherever they're coming from, and then what they're buying and what they're getting for that dollar. So to them, it's a bargain. And that just hurts, like you said, coming back to earlier, the local people it's hurting them the first time buyers is hurting them it's the same people that get hurt first time buyers definitely i don't the buyers that are unwilling to pull the trigger but can i think are the ones that are, are have missed the boat and, yes, and, and they will they mentally, and they, they know it yes and, and they mentally will not and it, it's fun to talk to them year after year well i think i think the market's getting ready to crash is what i hear repeatedly right. and i well, said we, yeah. hey man we had this conversation three years ago seven years ago nine years ago mm-hmm it hadn't followed. We, there's nothing going on in our market that it was like what we saw in 2005, six, seven, eight before that. Exactly. Crash. And it's, everyone thought we were going to see a repeat of that. And I, one of the things I try to explain is that back in 2008 and nine, people were buying homes with up to 107% finance. 
They were leaving the table with, with money, money, which is crazy. They didn't have any stake in it, right? Well, a lot of the people that are buying homes in our markets, they're putting a considerable amount down, if not paying cash for all of it. Yeah. So they're not walking away from a $300,000 down payment or a fully paid home. They're not. So that definitely affects what's going on. And it's, it's, it's hard, you know, you, you don't want to make a rash decision purchasing a home. It's a huge investment. But there is a lot of people that just cannot react that quickly. They're ponderers. I understand it. I respect it. It's just not very, um, just not working well in our current market conditions. And, you know, when we had uh, all of these increases that we started seeing two years ago, right? You had these experts. There was a so-called expert in Charlotte that wrote an article about how this is short-lived, that we're going to see a huge correction. And, you know, people read this stuff. And, oh, yeah. I mean, they're going to, they don't know who to believe. Heck, I don't know who to believe. Yeah. And all you can do is tell them, I, I don't see it. We're seeing increases. It's going to continue. Well, it never happened. And then now you have the interest rates. They've gone up a little bit. And they were told they're going to come back down. We're going to have a couple of decreases. Well, they didn't happen. And so they're waiting. And so I tell people that are concerned about the current market rate as far as their uh, loan goes. If you find a house, buy it. If you can get it worked out, buy it. You can always refinance you can if refinance. it does indeed come Absolutely. down in a year. You, could, you can refinance or if rates go up, you'll be patting yourself on the back. Either way, it's a win-win. Right. It, and I get it. It's hard. You've got people that are in homes with like 2.75 interest. I mean, it's hard to sell that house and buy another house if you're going to be paying, yeah. you know, six and three quarters or whatever. It's just, it'd be, you'd be crazy to do it, right? Unless you had to. Unless you had to. Right. So you've got this uh, very um, stuffy inventory situation. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for I having me. I am thrilled to have you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, it'd be wonderful to have you back down the road and uh, see where this leads. Well, thank you for having me. Teresa Huggins, everybody, take care. Have a great day.